The title of our lesson today is uh, The Spirits in Prison. That is uh, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 19. 1 Peter 3 and verse 19. So if anyone uh, does have, if you have your Bibles and you would like to, um, if you'd like to be turning there, you can mark some stuff up in your own Bible. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, a difficult section of Scripture this morning. Uh, and as I've stated up here before, it's, it's, only, it's only really a, a difficult section of Scripture, um, as a lot of difficult sections are, not necessarily because the concept itself is difficult. You know, the things that we're going to talk about today really aren't that hard to understand. Uh, for the most part, uh, everything in Scripture is easy enough to understand. Uh, almost uh, only, the only thing is sometimes we have to dig in uh, to understand a little bit more. Our young adult class covered this section in our Wednesday night class uh, two weeks ago, uh, and we dissected some things in this section of Scripture, uh, and it led to some very good discussion, so I decided to make it into a lesson up here. Uh, so let's go ahead and start by reading uh, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18, and we are going to go through verse 22. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. Through verse 22. So Peter explains to Christians, and he says, uh, For Christ also suffered once for sins. And it says, The just for the unjust. That is, the just suffered for the unjust. And why did he suffer? Uh, the verse says, That he might bring us to God. So Jesus suffered to bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, being made alive by the Spirit. And that is by being made alive by the Holy Spirit. Jesus was made alive. Uh, and verse 19 says, By whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. Verse 20, Who formerly were disobedient, when once the long suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. Verse 21 says, there is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God. Angels and authorities and powers having been made some subject to him. So if we go back and look at this section, uh, the confusing language comes from, of course, verse 19 there where Peter says, by whom, that is, by the Holy Spirit, Jesus went and preached to spirits in prison, the spirits who are now in prison. Uh, so where this becomes confusing is where it seems to say that Jesus preached in Noah's day. And the language sounds of that nature, uh, when the ark was being prepared to spirits in prison. And you ask, well, well when in the world did Jesus preach? In Noah's day, what, what is this talking about? And you say, well, what prisoners? What is this wording here? Maybe at first glance you start picturing Jesus, I don't know, secretly coming in Noah's time, and he went to some ancient jail or prison, and he preached to people before the flood. But no, that's not what this language is talking about. It might sound like that. There's a few confusing components about this section that makes it difficult to understand, but let's pick it apart uh, in this lesson. So first, let's talk about this prison that is referred to in this passage. The prison referenced here is beyond a shadow of a doubt. We're 100% certain after we study this. It is a reference to the abode of the wicked dead in a place we know as, as the spiritual realm called Hades which goes along with your handout for today. Hades is referenced over 11 times in the New Testament alone. Uh, by show of hands, how many of you remember studying anything about the Hadean realm, which is the waiting place for where spirits go after they die? And I think we've talked a lot about that up here. Uh, so that's the key to understanding this section. Now, this is not the false doctrine taught by Catholics of purgatory where a soul uh, goes to a temporary lodging after death, where they suffer and they pay their dues, and then they can get out of the suffering and get to go on to heaven or paradise, right? That's nowhere found in Scripture, okay? 
But what is found in the Bible is this place, this waiting place for the dead called Hades. The particular Greek word uh, that is translated as Hades, here's how it is defined. It is defined as the place of disembodied spirits. So when a, when a spirit is disembodied, left to the body is where the spirit goes. It is defined as the unseen realm, the realm of the dead. In the Old Testament, it is equivalent to the Hebrew word sheol, that's S-H-E-O-L, in which that word means the underworld. And it is also defined as the place of no return, right? Souls go there, they don't come back. So basically, this is where dead people go when their spirits leave their body, as they await the resurrection that is coming at the last day. It's a holding place before the resurrection. Spirits will be brought back to their body and before the judgment day. So seeing as how all the dead have not been raised yet, the judgment day has not taken place, and disembodied spirits have not been brought back to their incorruptible bodies, our conclusion is simple. All the dead are currently in this place called Hades, the whole realm of the dead. And if you can notice from the diagram, uh, there are two compartments of Hades, separated by a great gulf that cannot be crossed, Scripture talks about, as the dead await their final sentencing day and their destiny. Luke chapter 16, verse 23, says about the rich man when he died, that he woke up, and the Bible says, and being in torment in Hades... He lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham and Lazarus afar off in his bosom. Uh, So he woke up in the realm of the dead, and he could recognize. He saw Abraham and Lazarus in the realm of the dead with him. And he says in verse 24, says, Then he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus. uh, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Right? There is no cross in the gulf. So the Bible teaches that there are two sides of the Hadean realm, the realm of the dead. There is the paradise side, which is where Lazarus was and where Abraham was. And there is what we'll call in this lesson the prison side of Hades. Uh, Referred to in the New Testament, we'll study this word Tartarus in the Greek, which uh, is where the rich man was. So there's two sides here. So Hades is the place where all the dead go to await the the judgment. Now the righteous go and wait in a paradise. It's a place of comfort, a place of rest. The wicked go to a place of torments. It is a place of fire. And really, Scripture defines it as a prison. And we'll look at that language. If you remember, the Bible says Jesus was the only one to ever completely defeat this process as death was unable to hold the Son of God. Of course, when Jesus died, his body was placed in the tomb, where it remained there for three days, right? But the Bible says that his spirit went to Hades, the realm of the dead, just like every other person when they die. Jesus went through death. He did everything the way that everybody else does when they die. And he went to Hades. But you see, in Acts chapter 2 and verse 27, where we learn this, it says of David's prophecy of, the, of Jesus' resurrection, foretelling this. It says, for you will not leave my soul in Hades. And so it's going to go there, but it's not going to be left there. Nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. So normally Hades is the place of no return. Right? Everyone who has ever died has never come back to stay. Right, of course, some were resurrected at the time of Jesus and other times throughout uh, God's history and brought back. And really, that was to prove God's power. Uh, but the fact is, those resurrections, other than Jesus's, those resurrections were just signs to prove his power. But eventually, even those who were resurrected uh, in, in this time period had to die again. 
They were resurrected. They had to go back to Hades. They're still in Hades. So from the beginning of the world, when men die, they've all been held by this realm. Right? And there's just no coming back by our own power. No one can defeat it. Then the physical body back on earth, we know all about this process. It decays, it decomposes, and it sees full corruption. The body goes back to the earth as it was. And it's just a terrible process. But uh, Peter explained David's prophecy of Jesus' resurrection more thoroughly in Acts chapter 2 and verse 31. He said, David, foreseeing this, spoke concerning, he spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. Peter said this was a prophecy about Jesus. So did Jesus go to the Hadean realm? Yes, he did. But did God leave his soul there? Like every other person who's been left there since they died? No, Jesus was not left, left there. Well, what happened instead? Well, there was a resurrection. Jesus' body did not keep decaying and continue through the process of corruption and breaking down like normal. His spirit did not remain in Hades like all the rest of the dead, but God raised him up by the power of the Holy Spirit, the Bible says. Hades was unable to hold the Son of God. Jesus had the victory over it, and that's why we can trust in him for our own death that's coming. Now, real quick, someone says, well, hold on, Travis, just a minute, pause. Because Luke chapter 23 and verse 43 says that Jesus told the thief on the cross that they would go to heaven that very day. But now, hold on, wait a minute. Where did Jesus say that he would take the thief? Where did they, he say they would be that very day? Well, Jesus said to them, assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Okay, Jesus said, yes, we will die. We're, our spirits are, will leave our body. We will go to Hades. But listen, you will not be on the torments side. You will be with me in paradise. Jesus went to Hades. Jesus went to paradise in Hades. And this is where Abraham was in the realm of the dead. This is where Lazarus was and all the faithful. Of all the ages, after they've died, they've gone to paradise in Hades, this realm of the dead, as they all await the final judgment and entrance into the two final destinations. The righteous go to paradise, the wicked go to prison. Okay, so let's keep studying this uh, idea in Scripture. Let's study the place of, and I'll call it spirit prison, where the wicked dead go, and see what other evidence we can find about this place in Scripture. I have three points for you about this dreadful place that we can discuss uh, and that we call this spirit prison in Hades. Point number one, this uh, spirit prison is the place where God cast the angels who sinned against him. Okay, 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 14 says that God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to Tartarus, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. So here you have uh, the angels who had previ previously been where? In heaven. They sinned, and what did God do? Cast them down. Okay. Jesus said in Luke chapter 10 and verse 28, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Right, God kicked Satan and his followers out of heaven. They were angels. And, uh, but the question is, but to where? Where did God cast them? Peter says, God cast them down to Tartarus. Now, what in the world is Tartarus? I want you to listen carefully uh, to how this Greek word is defined because it is the only time the Greek word is used in the New Testament. Tartarus is the name of an underground region, sorrowful and dark, regarded by the ancient Greeks as the abode of the wicked dead. It's where the wicked go when they die, where they will suffer punishment for their evil deeds. So this is the place we've been talking about in Hades. 
the abode for the dead, not the abode for the righteous. So this is not the paradise side. This is the prison side that's being referenced here. You know, it's interesting uh, that the definition has reference to this place being, I guess you'd say underground is what the definition says. Because in uh, Ephesians chapter 4, and verse 9, it says that before Jesus asc- ascended into heaven, back into heaven, he first did what? Descended into the lower parts of the earth. Interesting language. I believe that is a reference to him going to the Hadean realm at his death for those three days where all the dead are located. And he descended into Hades, the lower parts of the earth. In Scripture, this whole spiritual realm of Hades is typically depicted with the language as being somewhere beneath us. That's just what the language says. The Old Testament sometimes calls it the pit. Luke chapter 8 and verse 31 calls it the abyss, which is defined as a deep, seemingly bottomless chasm. Revelation chapter 9 and verse 2 refers to it as the bottomless pit. It says, And he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. Next, I want you to consider from our verse in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4, uh, the phrase, casting the angels down to Tartarus, carries with it, actually in the, the original language, the idea of holding captive in Tartarus. Okay, it is a place of captivity, a place of restraint, quite literally a prison that they can't get out of. So first here we see that God kicked the angels out of heaven and put them in a place of restraint until the judgment. The good cross reference is Jude chapter 1 and verse 6 where it says, And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, right, they had been in heaven, but left their own abode, God has reserved in everlasting chains of darkness, there's the prison idea, for the judgment of the great day. So they're being held until the judgment. Point number two, what we learn about this place in the language, this is the place where chains of darkness hold the angels until judgment. Now, whether these chains are literal or representative Uh, The meaning is very simple. In one way or the other, the angels, the wicked angels, are bound by this place they can't leave. Okay, it is is a prison. Now, you know, I just want to go on on a little side tangent here. I think it's a good study. Is it possible that near the time of Jesus, that God allowed some of these wicked angels and followers of Satan to be set free for a time? I want you to think about that. I think that's actually quite a biblical possibility. You remember over and over in the gospel accounts, people dealing with these demon possessions, evil spirits. And we say, what? We don't see that today. We don't deal with that today. So you had these spirits that would overtake someone host their body and, and, and force their way in. And nobody had any idea how to control these evil spirits. Then Jesus comes along and exercises complete control over them. You know, so I personally lean towards the idea that God allowed the wicked angels from Tartarus, the spirit prison, I guess you would say, to roam free for a time. Now, why would he do that? I say it was to give people just one more reason to believe in the power of God through Jesus. Right? I mean, nobody knew how to deal with what they were calling demons. But Jesus comes along, has no trouble with them. Zechariah in the Old Testament, verses 13, or chapter 13 and verse 2, the Old Testament prophesies about when the Messiah would come. It says, And it shall be in that day, says the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols from the land, and they shall no longer be remembered. Right? The idols won't, their reputation won't secede them. I will also cause the prophets, and listen, the unclean spirit to depart from the land. The Old Testament prophesied that there would be these unclean spirits among the people, but the Messiah would come along and he'd get rid of them. Interesting. That's part of why we believe that demon possession and evil spirits were only temporary for the time period, as I would say a sign of Jesus' power. 
It seems that God only gave them freedom for a time so that Jesus could cast them out. Otherwise, why would God let that happen, right? To further prove that he was the Son of God. In Luke chapter 11, verse 15, you remember uh, when those who opposed Jesus accused him and said, he cast out these demons by the power of who? Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. Now, who is Beelzebub? Satan. Satan is another name for Beelzebub. They're saying the only way Jesus could have the power and authority over these demons is if he's, if he's using Satan's authority because he is, quote, the leader of the demons. But you know, in Matthew chapter 25, and verse 41, Jesus references the everlasting fire that, will be, that is prepared for the devil and his angels. Now you put two and two together here. Satan is the leader of the demons. Matthew 25 says he, it is Satan is and his angels. I think that helps to answer the question. Personally, I believe that demons were simply the angels who followed Satan in his downfall from heaven, referenced oftentimes as unclean spirits. God cast them down to Tartarus in Hades, the realm of the dead, to the prison side, and around the time of Christ, God let some of them out so that Jesus could show his power over them. Another passage that really hints in this direction is Luke chapter 8 and verse 28. You remember Jesus' confrontation with the naked, demon-possessed man who was very, very strong. Verse 28 says, when, when he saw Jesus, the man cried out, fell down before him, and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with you, Jesus? Son of the God, Son of Most High God, I beg you, do not torment me. Now think about that. So this this demon, first off, recognizes Jesus, knows exactly who he was, and I'd say that's because he had been in heaven with Jesus before, before he was cast down. Verse thirty, we actually find out that there were multiple demons inside this man. That's what part of what the problem was, why he was so strong. Then in verse thirty one, it says, and the demons begged him. That they would not, that he would not command them to go out into the abyss, and that's that word that is defined as a deep, seemingly bottom, bottomless chasm. They said, "Please don't send us into the abyss." It gives me the impression that they had been there. Don't make us go back to the abyss. Don't torment us. Right, uh, the impression I get is that they had been lodged there before, and the place terrified them. He said, "Please don't make us go back." That's why verse thirty-two says the demons begged Jesus not to send them into the abyss, but rather into a nearby herd of swine. So, number one, we've learned about this dreadful spirit prison that the angels are terrified of, as a place where God casts. It is a place where God casts the angels who sin, Tartarus. Number two. Chains of darkness hold them there until the judgment. Now, number three, we learn this. Not only is this a place where disobedient angels go, but it is also the place where the spirits of disobedient humans go. Point number three, all evil is reserved there for judgment, for the judgment day. All evil is reserved. I want you to listen to the flow of thought in Second Peter chapter 4. Verses 4 through 9. Listen to this section. Peter says, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but he cast them down to Tartarus and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for the judgment, and he did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly, and turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who would afterward live ungodly, and delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. Skip down to verse 9. It says, if God is able to do all that, listen, then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. Interesting. So there's that same language we saw with the disobedient angels. So with reference to humanity this time, not the angels, the Bible says unjust souls are reserved under punishment for the day of judgment. They're being reserved. 
So wicked humans who have died have not yet gone through this day of judgment because that hasn't happened yet, right? This verse says they are being held under punishment, reserved for the day of judgment, just like the wicked angels who are also in chains of darkness. You know, we know that Revelation chapter 20 and verse 14 tells us about the final victory on that great day for the faithful. When it is foretold that death and Hades will be cast into the lake of fire, right? That's Gehenna in Scripture, right? The, the Hades will be cast. This is the second death. I want you to think about this. The receptacle for the dead will finally be destroyed. The earth will be over. Dying will be over. Hades will have no more dead to collect. There won't really be any purpose for Hades anymore. And Hades will be destroyed, just like the earth. Then all the wicked, along with Satan and his angels, will be cast into Gehenna that has been prepared for them, the final dwelling place for all wickedness. Matthew 25, verse 41 says, Then he will say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 54, says to the righteous that this is when death will finally be swallowed up by victory. Sorry, death will finally be swallowed up in victory. So that's the day we get the victory on God's side. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? It says. Hades didn't have the victory over Jesus. And it will not have the victory over his followers either. Because those who become part of his kingdom are promised in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18 that the gates of Hades shall not prevail against this kingdom. If you're part of this kingdom, you'll win. Jesus said, he who believes in me will never die. That's what he's talking about. So we learn all about this holding place for the dead as, as they all await the judgment. There's the prison side, the paradise side. And if you were to die today, your soul would go to one of these two holding places. Isaiah chapter 50, or Isaiah 5 and verse 14 says, Therefore, Sheol, that is Hades in the Old Testament, Hades has enlarged itself and opened its mouth beyond measure. I want you to think about how many souls have ever lived and died on this earth. Think of just how many souls are in the realm of the dead right now, righteous and wicked. That's just an incredible number. And God only knows how many people that is. Hades is the place that collects all the spirits of men, all of them. And on the last day, Jesus will call all the dead from Hades. And the resurrection of all people will occur, righteous people and wicked people. Matthew chapter 5. And it will be time uh, to judge the entirety of mankind. So really, this place... Uh, referred to in the Greek as Tartarus, this spirit prison in Hades, is quite literally, and I like this word, it is death row for the wicked. A prison where they sit in their guilt waiting to see the judge. Right? They already know their sentence and what it will be. They already know their destiny. And they are currently experiencing punishment for their deeds right now, but they still wait the final sentencing day. And when they finally see God on Judgment Day, that's when they'll get all the reasoning from God and the explanation and the judgment itself for why they're going where they're going and why they are being punished. All men will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Every knee shall bow. Why would anyone choose not to be on God's side? So answering our primary text today, 1 Peter chapter 3, I think it helps this to become a lot clearer with what we're talking about. The text references preaching that was done to souls who are currently where? In the prison of Tartarus. No, they did not receive this preaching while they were in Tartarus, but while they were on earth. Right? Why I preach to souls who are already in the spirit prison? Because they couldn't leave if they wanted to. 
No, there are souls who are in Tartarus now, in spirit prison, who previously heard preaching on earth, but they refused it. That's what Peter's talking about. So the time period of sinners that Peter is referencing here is actually all those who died in the flood of Noah's day. The text references about these spirits in prison. It says, it says well, here's what I'm talking about. Those who were formerly disobedient. So they were disobedient. Wow, why, are they diso- why were they formerly disobedient? Because they're not disobedient anymore because they're in Hades. They're in Tartarus. Those who were formerly disobedient, when once the long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared. So the people of Noah's day were given a warning, a strong warning, it sounds like. They were given a way out, but they didn't listen to it, just like a lot of people today. And where did they all go after they died in the flood? Well, the Bible says spirit prison, Tartarus, death row for the judgment day. They are in the realm of the dead in chains of darkness being held for the judgment. One interesting part about this section uh, is that verse 19 tells us that Jesus preached to these men and women before they died and went to prison. Jesus preached in the day of Noah. What? The only thing that this verse leaves out is the messenger by whom Jesus preached. And it's talking about Noah. So you see, here's the way we can explain it. Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and the Father had a message of safety for the people of Noah's day. Jesus, with the other two members of the Godhead, had a message of salvation for mankind, how they could be saved, repent and be saved, or perish in your sins. Two options. Verse 19 says, By the Holy Spirit, Jesus preached. But what this means is that Jesus sent the Holy Spirit. So it was Jesus' message. He was sending the Holy Spirit to communicate through Noah. Noah was the messenger to bring the message to the lost world. It is representative talk that says Jesus spoke through someone else, right? We see that a lot in Scripture. It's sort of like today when, you know, how the New Testament says the Holy Spirit will convict sinners through the preaching of the Word. Right? Well, who is actually convicting the sinners? It's the Holy Spirit. Well, how's He doing it? Through us when we preach the Word. So the Godhead speaks through their messengers. And in the same way, that's what happened in Noah's day. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, they communicated by sending the Holy Spirit through Noah and his uh, power. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5 says it was Noah who was the preacher of righteousness to the lost world. So the meaning of verse 19 goes like this. By the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus preached through Noah to the spirits who are currently, talking about when Peter's writing, in the prison of Tartarus. Noah preached to wicked men. By the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus' message, Noah preached it. The people didn't listen. They died. Now they are in spirit prison in the realm of the dead. Verse 20 explains who these men were. It says, who were formerly disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah. God waited in the days of Noah. He gave them time to repent. There was a message. They didn't listen. So Noah preached while the ark was being prepared. Now listen, it says, in which a few, that is eight souls, only eight souls, were saved through water. It has been estimated that there would have been well over a million people on the earth at the time of the flood. And only eight souls, let's use that number, eight souls out of a million people were saved. That's it. The rest didn't want to pursue righteousness. Only, and if you do a percentage, that is 0.000008% of the whole world's population were saved. And people say, man, you guys are a narrow-minded bunch. You think that you're the only ones going to heaven. The Bible says, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. And narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are very few who find it. The eight souls 
who followed the narrow path in Noah's day, the Bible says, were saved through water. The ark was made to float on top of the water. And the surface of the water actually lifted the ark up above the destruction that was taking place, all the destruction taking place down beneath. And Peter said, this water is actually what saved them from the destruction going on beneath them. And it was because of the water and the ark, obviously, that they were saved. So he says in verse 21, talking to people today and the salvation available today, he says, there is also an antitype which now saves us. Baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. It's how you get a good conscience. Peter says, in a similar fashion to how water saved them, water saves us. Baptism. And, you know, that statement, it's not like it's holy water or it's cleansing the dirt off you or whatever that is. The point is, it's how you attain a good conscience before God. The ESV translates it as an appeal for a good conscience. You're begging God through this avenue, please give me a good conscience. So Peter says, we get baptized to get saved. There's no salvation without water in the plan. So God saved through water in the time of Noah. God saves through water today, plain and simple. And by the way, Peter finishes up this section by saying that this was made possible through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. So let me give you three quick take-home lessons, and we will close. Number one, when we die, we'll either go to prison or paradise as we await the judgment. Number two, once in prison, if you go to the prison side, there's no change in that destiny. That's what we see in the, with the rich man and Lazarus. He wanted to change his destiny. And number three, Therefore, let us aim for paradise by obeying the gospel and obeying God. It is so sad to say that there are many souls in this spirit prison right now, like the rich man who is still there from Luke chapter 16, tormented him along with the fallen angels. There they all wait in chains, in darkness, with no hope, Ben talked about prison uh, in class today. He said, What's, what do they usually have in, in prison? They have a calendar where they can mark off the days. That gives them hope. We're, my sentence is almost done. Well, not this prison. But then there are the faithful who await the resurrection in paradise. And all the dead, all the faithful from all the ages who you've known, and I've known. They're hopefully there. In Genesis chapter 25, Genesis 25 and verse 8 says, Then Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years. And he was gathered to his people. One version said he joined his ancestors. So Abraham entered paradise with his loved ones who had entered paradise. So I just ask you this morning, what side of Hades will you be on if you die today? The invitation is simple. If you're not a Christian, you have to become one. By hearing that gospel, believing it, repenting, confessing, and being baptized, we can help anyone with that if they're interested. And for those who are a part of the Lord's church, let us think about our souls dearly today. Make sure before you leave this building today that you're going to be on the right side of Hades and after judgment. So that's the invitation as we stand and as we sing.